Gospels, Luke chapter 24, Luke the 24th chapter. We just finished, uh, and it took us a couple of months, the seven last sayings from, from the cross, which is the most powerful series I probably will ever preach because it's just a powerful subject matter. Now, after that, though, somebody said, well, what are you going to preach? Well, you've you got to stay with it just a little bit. Jesus' last words on the cross were, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. It was the Hebrew prayer that they would pray every night. Now, I don't know if you pray every night before you go to bed, and let's not lie about it. You know, some nights you fall asleep without praying, and it just happens. So you'll eat a meal, or you'll get in the middle of a meal, and you say, oh, man, I messed up. I should." The issue of praying is giving God thanks for life. Giving God thanks for the food. Giving God thanks for the, your breath. Amen. All the, the thanks for your children, your family, your friends. All of those things. That's what prayer to me becomes. It, be, it becomes a praise time. But they would pray that. And, of course, what a, what a fitting prayer. Be the last saying on the cross. Uh, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Then he fell asleep. Nobody took his life. I know we, we've heard people say that Jesus was murdered, this, that, and the other. He wouldn't allow that to happen. He, uh, he absolutely laid down his life he gave it up he allowed his blood to flow out he knew this was for redemption now after his death the scripture records this and i'm going to just read something out of the book of matthew and then i'll be with luke 24 in a minute but it says the next day the one after preparation day the chief priest and the pharisees went to pilate sir they said we remember that while he was still alive that deceiver said after three days i will rise again so give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal his body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception then would be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate said, answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. Are you comfortable? Now Luke 24. So what we got now is a, a round stone in front of a new tomb that was once owned by a guy named Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph, of course, is connected with a guy named Nicodemus. You remember Nick at night? He showed up at night and talked with Jesus in John chapter 3 when he asked the question, what should a man do to be born again? Jesus said uh, that, that uh, and that's where we get to Scripture for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Belief is the big word. We get the word believer. From it, we believe. Everybody say, I believe. believe. Now, if you don't believe, don't, don't, re don't repeat after me. But if you believe, I think you do because you're here today. Luke 24, verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes uh, that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? I love that. Why do you look for the living among the dead? I never go to a cemetery looking for somebody alive. Uh -huh, it don't happen. So here the scripture says, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. Everybody say, he's not here. He's, not here. he's risen. Remember how he told you that while he was still with you in Galilee, again the angels speaking, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, then be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. And they remembered his words. Now this is what Luke said. Sixty years after Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is why it's important for you to know this. Sixty years later, John wrote about this experience and what took place. That's why this is important when you're reading John because John's going to, he's going to look stuff back and he's going to roll it back. He's the one that said in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God. He doesn't talk about the birth of Christ. He talks about him in the beginning, the very beginning, the very Genesis. So John chapter 2 verse 17, and his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house has eaten me up. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, well, what sign will you show unto us, seeing that you do these things? And Jesus answered and said, watch this. You destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up again. Then said the Jews, 40 and 6 years this temple has been here. And you're going to say, talking about Solomon's temple, that you would tear it up in three days. You'll raise it up in three days. But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples 
remembered. Sometimes it's a traumatic experience that helps you to remember what it is that God wanted all along been trying to say to you. You've been floating through life, and all of a sudden, boom, there's, there's been a death, there's been a resurrection, something that's taking place, amen, and it helped you remember. And he said unto them, and they believed the Scripture and the word which Jesus had said. The most characteristic word of the Christian life is the word resurrection. Resurrection. Everybody say resurrection. If you to choose one word to gather up and focus and express the very essence of the New Testament faith. This would have to be your choice. Christianity defined as a religion of resurrection. Therefore, the church is a community of resurrection. Far too often we have regarded the resurrection as an addendum to the gospel. My friend, the resurrection is the gospel. Amen. It's, it's death, burial, and resurrection. That's the good news. And that's the good news we share. It separates us from everyone else. So my thought today is, is very important. He rose. Ain't that enough? Isn't that enough for us to get into our lives and say, you know what? He rose up. He got up. Isn't that? Do I have to keep proving this thing over and over again? Jesus said it, uh, I think like 10 times. You put this body down, this body's coming back up. And he also gave us resur- uh, a revelation that these bodies are temples. Amen, that this is the temple where God dwells. If he's dwelling in me and de- dwelling in H and dwelling in D, dwelling in Travis, if he's de- dwelling in us, how much difference when we all get together should it make? There ought to be resurrection in every house of God today. Can I get an amen? Amen, we're su- resurrecting of hope, resurrecting of dreams, resurrecting of healing, resurrecting of life. Amen, all these things need to resurrect. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your anointing. Lord, I understand without anointing with nothing, so I ask that it rest upon me today as I share your word. I give you praise for your resurrection in jesus name and everyone said amen. come on shout it out amen. amen the entire gospel rests in the fact of the resurrection in resurrection according to the webster dictionary comes from the same latin word as surge which means a strong swelling or rolling like a wave, a sudden rush to move in, a tsunami. When Jesus resurrected, it was a spiritual tsunami that took place, so much so that the Scripture says the dead were, were coming up out of the graves. He, of course, we know about the temple or, 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 or tearing at his death, but at his resurrection, amen, great things. It, it changed everything. It shifts everything. Resurrection, again, to rise again, to bring back to life or coming back into use. I love when I hear about people getting resurrected. What I mean is, you once heard the gospel, and, and, and many times, it, it's almost a mean word we say, they backslid. But it, to me, it's like they almost died spiritually. You just started going back, and, and you see your fire started going out. But there has to be a resurgence in one's life. There has to be a coming back. There has to be an understanding that after this death, uh, whatever I've gone through in life, I've got to come back into it. And, David asked me this week, he said, Pastor, what is the greatest thing about pastoring? I said, well, I love making people happy. I love seeing people smile. And then I thought about it a little bit longer. I said, well, that ain't good because I sure can't make everybody happy. It just don't work. So, so I guess, you know, the best thing about pastoring is watching dead people come alive. Come it's watching when people catch it. It's when they get hold of it. it and you'll see it happen, particularly among the blondes. It just, boom. It just, it, 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 it. it I'm sorry, sis. Amen. Uh, but 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 yeah, but it'll, it'll it'll just click on. It it just. I see Cheryl. As you getting okay. All right. Today I'm believing God for a resurrection, not just for you, but for those watching on HolyWild.tv. Amen. A resurrection of purpose. A, a, a resurrection, a resurgence of power. Amen. Inside of you, a refreshing of life. To resurrect means to bring into view attention or use again. In other words, you thought I was out, but now I'm back. I have gone through resurrections in my life. I've been out, and now I'm back. There's, uh, there's something about just making that resurgence, just to stand up again. Resurgence means to rise and again, to activity, to prominence, to, to, to be able. And I don't know exactly. The Bible calls it the resurrection of the dead. Now, let me deviate from my, my thoughts here uh, on, on, the, on the pad. But, but he, listen, when God resurrects you, it's not going to be rest in peace. When God resurrects us, when the graves open up again and the bodies of those that we have loved come back and get a glorified body, I believe that God has a great purpose for us on the other side. 
Now, I, again, this is one of those things that religions try to work on and try to figure out. I don't know. All I know is what I do here will matter there. That how I live here, how I love here, how I forgive here, how I care here is going to matter when I get to the other side. And I have this hope. It's faith. that I, it's, it's Faith is something that I cannot see, but yet I believe that it's going to be there. And when God resurrects these bodies, there's going to be a resurgence of power. There's going to be a resurgence of, of purpose that God has. And if he could give me six 60, 70, 80 years on this planet and say, okay, you had purpose there. Wait till I give you an eternity. And I know many of you think, well, I just want to live forever. Seriously. Are you serious? Not in this body do I want to live forever. I dream of another place. I hope for another place. Amen. I've got too many people and family and friends that have gone on with this body wore out on them. I, I'm not looking to the, this whole issue of I just want to live forever. I just want to do it. Uh, listen, you can stretch it, pin it up, cut it, uh, uh, operate on it, whatever. But eventually, it's going to give out. Amen. And when it does, thank God there's another purpose for us in another place. Now, let's talk about what Jesus said here in John 2. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. When he said that, the Jews said 46 years was this temple to build it. It was Solomon's temple. He's standing in church. He's standing among the artifacts, the articles, the ark, the fire, the table, the, the labor, all the things that are in the holy place, in the holy of holy place. Everything was right. Every stone was in place. The only thing wrong was the activity inside the house. And let me mention this to you. Churches all over the world have artifacts. They have labors. They have, they have places of, of altars to for forget all these things. And it looks everything in place. The only problem was there was no relationship. This, this God gospel we preach this christianity we talk about is a relational let me say it like this without you this thing don't work without the one next to you this thing don't work it became a ritual among the people a religious but not a relational reality what church should be if we can ever get him into the temple i'll tell you he'll cleanse the temple and he'll take ownership of it and then he's going to resurrect it one of the things god wants to do is resurrect the house of god amen and you're the temple everybody say i'm the temple Woo, you mean to your temple. Man, we are, aren't we? I, I, again, I looked at my boy the other day, and I said, if I knew I was going to live this long, I'd have sure took a little better care of this temple. Amen. I'd have done something a little bit different with it. Maybe not. Maybe I'd have still pushed it to the limit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Again, Jesus gives us revelation. Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. See, we got, if you can explain the Godhead to me, you would be one of the most amazing people I've ever met. But I see Jesus as God. You know that. I see the Father as God. I see the Holy Ghost as God. I see these three are one. You know, it, it's a glory, again, it's a glorious mix-up to me. I don't have all the answers for it. But he says the God, the Holy Ghost, is going to live in you. The temple is where the Spirit of God dwells inside of us, which is in you, which you have of God. And you are not your own. For you bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. This hit me. First off, most sacrifices are dead. They're going to die. And so we crawl up living. And being alive, it's, it's tough on us because we still want to do our own thing. We want to go where we want to go, do what we want to do, eat what we want to eat, drink what we want to drink, uh, be with who we want to be with. We, we do this. Thing, and yet the Scripture says, whoa! Everybody say, whoa! Well, you got to hold on a minute. You are not your own. Now when I realize I don't belong to me, then I belong to a higher power. Amen. Christ himself, God, the Holy Spirit, all these things rolled up inside of me. Now i got to back off before I make certain decisions. And i got to say, Lord, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? Who do you want me to connect with? I need to know from you. It's okay. Matter of fact, it's more than okay. You're not your own. You, your, your place in life is to, it's not just voluntarily do it, but say, God, I need your direction. Amen. You bought me. You died for me. You created me. Uh, that's three times I'm yours. So now I look at this and I realize the Spirit of God is inside of me. And when you got the Spirit of God inside of you, that's when I call that red, yellow, green light. I'm a yellow light runner. <laughs> Let me just admit that. If you're with me on a motorcycle and you're in front of me and that light turns yellow, I want you to know I'm a yellow light runner. If you hit your brakes, I'm probably going to blow right on by you. Because that's just like, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that yellow says go. That's what it is. What is it? 
yeah. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Yeah, yeah, hurry, hurry, hurry. But in my spirit, in my spirit, I have this yellow light when I get around people, and it doesn't tell me to go. It tells me to check them out. That there's a spirit that when you've got a business dealing, when you've got job opportunities, when you have relational connections, when you connect, there's some people that want to get to know you too fast. They want to connect with you too quick. They, 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 they all act, you know, it, so you've got to be careful that you've got to say, all right, I'm, going to, I'm the temple of the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost dwells inside of me, and he's going to give me direction here that I'm not going to be deceived. I'm not going to be messed up here. Listen to the voice. Listen to this, because that's a part of your resurrection. Many times we've been spiritually mute. We can't hear nothing. Amen. It's like the button been hit. we we got to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church. And so when God talks to us, we listen, Romans 8, 11. And by the way, that could save you finances, time, uh, 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 f- your future, if you listen to what God, because you don't belong to you. I mean, you look like you do, but you don't. Amen. As a matter of fact, if you did belong to you, you do need to do just a little bit better job. Okay, all right. Uh, Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Now, if you're young, this scripture may not mean a whole lot to you because you're already quick. You're already mobile. You can already put your big toe in your mouth. But when you get around my age, a little bit older, and you've been wore out a little bit, that, this means the world to you. That that same spirit that raised Christ up from the dead, if it dwell in you, it will quicken. It will raise. It will resurrect. It will resurge. It will give power to your body. And you say, now, I, say, I stand on this. It's, I mean, if I take an aspirin believing my headache will go away, I'll stand on this scripture believing that any day, any time, God can quicken my body and make this body come alive. Well, Pastor, you what? I got a disease in my body. I got this, that, the other. It's, it goes over all that. It jumps over diabetes and cancer and muscular dystrophy and it just just jumps on you don't know what's going to happen well yeah you do when you ask for it and at times i ask lord quicken my body i'm wore out i'm tired but you got to quicken this and, and it's like the most amazing thing that takes place oh years ago i was connected with a grandpa he was like my grandpa his name was brother dodge john dodge he was personal friends with with uh, john osteen he would call him out in a congregation brother dodge was one of them living prophets amen god would talk to him and he would move he had i don't know eight nine ten kids i i, I quit counting amen he had they were all over the place he said dodges were everywhere and 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 he would he would come to church and i remember the day it happened i was a young youth leader in north alabama and i took some of the guys by the little church where i was uh was spiritually connected to and he was told because he was too much of a fireball the board told the pastor he can't preach here well he was the pastor's father-in-law which made it a difficult little situation so he come into town expecting to preach. Well, it was a Saturday night youth rally. Five churches had gotten together in this little church, and we had packed it out. When I say packed it out, about 120 people in the church. It looked like it hold about 80. Eight, so we were really feeling good in there. Had the band crank it, and I was over the service. And I remember I looked back at Brother John Dodge, and I said, John, uh, uh, Grandpa, you want to preach? And he'd already got his feelings hurt, told he couldn't preach. And, and he, and, and, but now it's... My decision, because I don't go to a board. I've never been real good with boards or committees and things. Okay. Anyway, so, so I said, would you like to preach? He, said, he, said, he shook his head. No, and then Granny Dodge, she about that tall. She said to me, she said, yeah, I'll let you know, which means she's going to work on it church going on man the spirit of god moving through that place kids are getting blessed we having a time and i look back there at him and there that little old man sat there 80 something year old and i saw him do this and i knew what was happening if that same spirit that raised christ from the dead dwell in you it'll quicken your mortal body and then i saw it for the first time in my life he got behind the pulpit and he looked at these teenagers you say what does an 80 something year old man got to do with a bunch of teenagers he connected them straight to heaven when he said ha 
Lay Lou, yeah! And he kicks his leg out, and I'm watching from the front row, and he does it again. Ha! Lay Lou, yeah! And he kicks his leg out again. The kids' eyes are like that. They rear back, and then he does it again. Ha! Lay Lou, yeah! And he brought both legs up and hovered them a little while, and I knew we was in for a meeting then. All right, I might have stretched that third one just a little bit, but it sure felt like that. And then it was on like Donkey Kong, man. I mean, uh, the Spirit of God hit them kids. And I looked around at them old board members. And I realized if you don't want to be raised from the dead, you're just going to die. Amen. You got to want it. Can I get an amen? amen? Quicken, to revitalize, to revive, to resurrect. He'll do that for you. That's a word you stand on. There are times I've seen people come up out of the... I prayed over a woman. I think I mentioned this a month or two ago. But I prayed over a woman that was in hospice. She was dying. She was dead, according to them. Her breath had gotten so shallow. Her family had gathered around. I just walked in to pray over her. I, and I actually, while I'm praying over her, I said, Sis, you got any last words? She sat up in bed. Her family ran out of the house. I gathered them back in. She looked at them, rebuked them, chewed them out for being divisive and fighting over her stuff. And when she finished, she laid down and died. Yes, I witnessed that. If the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in your mortal body, the body that's died, it'll quicken it. It'll quicken it. Last year, two, a little over a year ago, I went and prayed for a woman who again was in hospice care, dying. She's out. They hadn't talked in three days. I walked into her bedroom and said, Blessed assurance. Her eyes closed, she said. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, all is at rest. Me and my Savior, I'm happy and blessed. And then she died. If the same spirit that raised him from the dead, dwell, how important is the resurrection? It's everything to us believers. It, it's, it's the thing that sets us apart. M Micah 7, 8, rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I will rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be my light unto me. When I fall, yeah, not if, but we all fall. There's, a, there's these issues in life that cause us to stumble. But we have a resurrected Christ dwelling in us that says every time we fall off the wagon, every time we mess up, get up, get up. Get, you want to rise again. Get up. And there's that resurgence, that, that desire. Well, and then we beat ourselves up. But you listen to the voice from heaven. Amen. Get up. Amen. We were made to bounce back. That's why your butt's round and not square. You were made to bounce back, amen, to get back up again. The time, and let me, I'm going to start closing here some, but the time, Hosea 6, 1, 3 says, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He's smitten. He'll bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise again, uh, rise up again, and we shall live in his sight. Ten times in the Gospels, Jesus said, I'm going to rise on the third day. I, I, one day I'm going to preach again on the third day principle, but there's something about the third day. Third day is, is, is not only death, burial, resurrection, but it's also seed time and harvest. Amen. And if I plant something, I believe God is going to come back. Amen. Something's going to come back. It's either victory or vanity. 1 Corinthians 15. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. And your and my faith is empty. Yes, we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up. If in fact the dead do not rise, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile in vain. You are still in your sins. Everything that we've done, what not matter. If Christ, this is why this thing is by faith. And it's so important. To, I'm on my way here this morning. I'm thinking, now, Lord, I'll be honest with you today, Jesus. I don't feel it. I don't, can we have church tomorrow? Because I don't feel it today on Sunday. I don't feel it. And it was like, just like a light bulb. You live by faith. Yeah. 
Amen. You don't see it, but you'll get there, and I promise you, I'll quicken you. I'll help you out of here. There are three things about the resurrection that I pick up out of this. First, we know that his resurrection gives assurance of the judgment. Acts 17, 31, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the, by, by the man, by his appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. I don't have to worry about judging you right now. You ain't got to worry about judging me. We're going to let God judge us. Amen. With a just, just justice. And I believe God by faith that all my sins are under the blood. Amen. I got to live that way. I got to trust him in, in everything that I do here. We realize, second, that his resurrection gives assurance of the forgiveness of sins. Corinthians 15, 17, and if Christ has not been raised from, the, from uh, raised, your faith is futile, you're still in your sins. Well, I want to tell you something. I know the freedom of feeling free from your sins. Amen. It is, it's like, therefore, there is now no condemnation, Frank, for right. those that are in Christ Jesus. Right. That walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So if I'm walking with Him, I don't have to beat myself up or listen to anybody else to beat myself up. Amen. I'm not in condemnation. Now, conviction means when God touches it, I say, Lord, forgive me. I turn from that. But condemnation is anything after that. So every time Satan tries to remind me, of my sins, of my past, of, of the things that I've done, and yourself. When he died, that's condemnation. I ain't got to have that. Amen. The, the resurrection proved I'm forgiven. Amen. I stand on that right there. And next, my friend, we realize that the resurrection gives us our only hope. Everybody say hope. hope. Corinthians 15, 18. Then those who also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. Romans 10, 9. That if I confess with my mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Now, listen, I know there's this, this fight going on in the body of Christ. I've picked up on it over the last few months, actually, been hearing it more and more about somebody saying, well, you can't just say a sinner's prayer and be saved. I did. I asked God to forgive me of my sins and to come into my life and to turn me around. Now, it was up to me to walk this thing out. So when I tell you that if you confess with your mouth the word of God and believe that God rose Jesus from the dead and you have that hope, you are saved. Yeah. Amen. You are on your way to heaven. Now it's up to you to walk this thing out. It ain't the preacher's job, your mama's job, your grandma's job, your grandpa. It's your job to walk out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Amen. And say, God, all right. Now, he says here, I, I just gave you plenty of gospel today for all of us to grab hold of and realize that the Spirit of God dwells in us. We are his temple. Lord, help me with, with my red, yellow, and green lights. Amen. As I walk through this thing in life, uh, I was with all these bikers a couple of weeks ago, and somebody asked across the table, a good old Baptist boy, he said, how's that man preach? He pointed over at me. He said, how do you preach? I said, I ain't telling you. He said, well, I want to come here. Yes, that's good. You should. But then he looked at I said, ask them, the guys that go to church with me. And one of the guys says, well, I, I'm going to tell you. He's going to tell you what he's going to tell you. Then he's going to tell you. Then he's going to tell you what he told you. I said, you got it right. That's good. That's how you preach. You tell them what you're going to. A lot of times, just like dealing with your grandkids, you tell them, then you tell them what you told them, then you tell them, then you tell them, then you tell them what you told them. Because they're going to ask you, what, what, what? The stone was rolled away from the door. The women went, Josiah, with the spices. And I, I, I guess they were going to re-spice him. You follow me? I mean, what do you do? You bring flowers to the grave? You know, those, the, some fragrance. Yeah. So they're going to re-spice him. They go, they, he'd been dead three days, and, and they knew that Lazarus stunk after a couple of days, so they're going to go re-spice him. Right. And when they get there, there's, there's a stone, and there's right. guards. And, and one scripture said the guards were still there when the women got there, and they is stone <laughs> frozen like the stone because mm. the angels come down, and they just stiffen up right then. <laughs> Amen. The stone has been rolled away. It wasn't rolled away to let him out. It was rolled away to let them in. Mm. Many times I say, well, if that stone hadn't rolled away, Jesus would still be in there. Are you kidding me? Come 
He walked through walls. Yeah. He didn't need a stone to hold him in. He needed to let other people into their life. Many times, what is the stone that God needs to roll away from your life? Amen. So you can get in to get a little bit closer to him. We, we, we could have blown, he could have blown the cave apart, walked through the walls. Uh, uh, Matthew 28, 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. You know, we into all these Marvel characters and Avengers and all that. And, and the great. Can you imagine uh, uh, an angel coming from heaven and hitting the earth so hard that it caused an earthquake? I know you're thinking, was he heavy? God called big boy angel over. Hey, big boy angel. I need you to go to earth. He, he don't, go, go, don't go slow. I want you to open it up, baby. Amen. I want you to kick it in all the way down to earth. You don't, I, don't slow down when you hit it. When you hit it, just hit it. Amen. When you hit it, it's going to do exactly what I want it. Old big boy angel comes down from everywhere. Boom! When he hit the earth, the, the stone just rolled. Because he hit one side of the grave, you know, and it just rolled toward his side. The angel's got, I can't prove any of this, you know that. But it does sound good, don't it? I mean, you can't disprove it. Stone roll over. They, they, they stiffen up like this. The girls come to respice him. They go in and look at it. The Roman seals broke. The stone had been rolled away. The Roman guard not only stiffened, some ran away. The grave clothes were empty and undisturbed. How can you take a body, a dead body, out of grave clothes and still make them look like grave clothes? Unless the body just resurrected out of the grave. Mm -hmm. There, there were hundreds of eyewitnesses of Jesus after he rose from the dead. Jerusalem was the very last place on earth that Christianity could have started if Jesus hadn't really list, uh, risen from the dead. And the biggest thing, the biggest thing of the resurrection changed lives. It's, it's everything we teach and preach. A life that was changed. The lives of the disciples were changed forever. They went from being a frightened rabble to being willing to die for their faith. Of all people in history who would die for what they believe, the disciples of Jesus were unique because they were in a position to know whether or not it was true or false. They didn't get it by second hand. They walked with him on the water. They saw the resurrection of Lazarus. They saw the lepers healed. They saw the blind eyes open. They knew who Jesus was. And when he rose from the dead and came back and visited them it was worth dying for I will not give up my faith I will not give up my hope it is in the resurrection stand with me the resurrection proved that Jesus really was God he really is worthy of our worship he can really forgive us of our sins he reconciled us back to God yeah 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 Mankind had a problem. We disconnected from our Creator. It's still the thing that's going on today, disconnected from Him. And the cross took care of the gulf that which was between us and Him. And it reconnected the Father, the heart of the Father, back to us. 1 Corinthians 2, 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Satan thought he had him. The devils were rejoicing. Friday, everything was dying. The hope of the disciples were dying. The hope of the world, dying. Saturday, it just even looked worse. You can imagine the living by faith on that Saturday. There was no feelings. It was just fear. They went and hid themselves in a room, the Scripture says. But Sunday, 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 something happened. The earthquake, the stone rolled, the angel sitting there. The big boy said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? <laughs> he has risen like he said he would. I find that every promise he made, he kept. I'm going to rise going to do it we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory which none of the rulers of this age knew for had they known they would not have crucified the Lord of glory had Satan known had Pilate Herod had any of them known had evil known they wouldn't have done it but they put their foot 
right into the snare. Amen. And whoop, up off the ground. And when he rose again, every promise you and I need, the hope I have. Tomorrow I will do a, a funeral of a 51-year-old woman. 51. Life, this is life. So what we got to give to one another is pass on hope. We got to pass it on and tell folks it's about the resurrection. Eyes closed, heads bowed. God, I'm praying right now for a resurrection of physical bodies in here. Oh, we treat this, this as this physical body goes. So often we go, Lord, help us turn it around. Lord, let our spirits become the most important thing that as it goes, our physical body has to follow. It's got to get in line. It's got to line up. All, all the, the, the things that are broken got to get back right. All the diseases got to leave. The spirit is ahead and the body's got to follow. God, I want to stand and believe that this can happen in our lives. Give us resurrection. Give us hope. Quicken our bodies. God, I pray in Jesus' name. Don't let us leave here the way we came in. Pastor, I need a little bit. I need hope this morning. This word, I want it to seal inside my heart. If that's you, slip your hand up. Just need hope. Just need hope. Amen. Thank you. Just hold those hands. I just need hope. I need hope for my family. I need hope for my kids. I need hope for my job. I need hope. Now let's pray together. Lord Jesus, that same spirit that rose you from the dead dwells in me. Quicken me and give me hope for my future. I believe it. I'm going to stand on it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me say this again. He rose. Ain't that enough? Do you need to add to that? Do you need anything else? Yeah, he did. He rose from the dead and did hoop de hoops on his way. No, no, he rose. That's good enough for me. Amen. High five somebody before you sit down and say, let's give, give each other hope. Amen. That's what we need. God bless you. you may be seated. Our servant leader is coming up. Do you know what makes a good movie? A really good setup. Just a really good setup. And that's why this gospel story, it's just a re- once you look at it, it's just a really good setup. That devil never saw it coming. Amen. He didn't see the setup. And God had, you can play checkers with a lot of people. I'm a decent checker player if I get the first move. But there's one game that always stumped me, and that's chess. You know why? Because you've got to think so far ahead. Don't play chess with God. You'll lose that one. Amen. Be faithful in your giving. Amen. In your tithe and offering as we move through our summer. Uh, and again, and I, I, let me reiterate, fellowship with one another. Yeah. Invite one another out. Do things with one another. Amen. And when we have our Sunday afternoon meetings with our, our swap, or our, our lift with our ladies, all those things, or, or when the jewels get together, get together with one another. Connect with one another. And you say, well, Pastor, I'm still just a little bit bored. Well, come out Tuesday morning. <laughs> We got about a hundred little cheering to throw off, and they're not going to do the swing, but they are going to do. It's a it's a, a daycare outfit. The next two Tuesdays, we're going to be throwing little kids, and they're fun to throw. Yeah. You can throw them two at a time. They little, amen. Come out and just hang. You say, well, if they get, what if there's a lot of volunteers? So what? Many hands make light work. Yeah. We'll just fellowship together. Shoot, I put a harness on you and throw you off.